All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is chapter uh, 19. Again, we're doing this as part of the Stats Modeling the World curriculum. Uh, we are talking about confidence intervals. So in our last chapter, in chapter 18, we talked about sampling distributions. And we found that um, both, no matter whether you're using uh, proportions or means, categorical data or quantitative data, uh, that a uh, sampling distribution is going to end up looking fairly normal. The difference being uh, what the standard deviation will be. And so when we're working with categorical data, the standard deviation ends up being the square root of p times 1 minus p, right, that's what q is, 1 minus p, divided by n, the sample size. And when we're dealing with means, we have uh, the, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Uh, now, if we don't know something about the population, um, that does not mean that we're stuck and that we can't uh, proceed with any sort of calculations. When it comes to uh, creating uh, sampling distributions and uh, this inference that we're studying, uh, we can use sample statistics to estimate these population parameters. Um, when we do that estimation, we instead of calling it the standard deviation, um, we're going to call it the standard error. Uh, now, this it doesn't mean a whole lot when it comes down to the actual calculations. Um, because the standard error, notice this is the exact same formula as before, right? It's just that instead of using the p times q, we're saying it's p hat q hat. Uh, and again, the difference being p hat is our sample proportion, right? Um, whereas p is our population proportion. Uh, in terms of our calculations, there is really no difference. Um, it's just a matter of the way that we are, uh, the way that we're thinking about this question. Uh, we will not always have information about the population. Um, sometimes that information is uh, either uh, very difficult to obtain or almost impossible to obtain because populations are too large. Uh, so we do these same calculations, uh, but we use the sample that we're working with instead of the population that we're working with. Uh, and again, uh, for means and quantitative data, uh, it's the same thing. Instead of using the population standard deviation, which is what this is, okay, the, the out, that sigma symbol is the population standard deviation, uh, this S is the sample standard deviation. Now, if we're looking for things about quantitative data and using this formula, uh, you're going to need to skip ahead a few chapters uh, because we don't deal with uh, stuff about means until we get to chapters uh, 23 through 25. Okay, uh, 19 through 22 is all working with um, categorical data. So that's what we're starting on in this particular chapter. And uh, the first thing that we want to introduce to you is this idea of what's called a confidence interval. So a sampling distribution for a model of p hat is centered at p with this standard deviation, p times the uh, square root of pq over n. Uh, we don't know p, uh, and we can't find the true standard deviation of the sampling distribution. So we estimate it with the standard error, like we were saying in the last slide, uh, with this square root of p hat q hat over n. And again, Q is uh, one minus P hat. Okay, uh, so we're gonna we can estimate that sampling distribution with the sample parameters or the sample statistics. Um, we know from looking at the 6895.99.7 rule that if my sampling distribution is centered at P hat. That one standard deviation away, uh, we're going to have in either direction, I should say. Uh, so we're going to call that the square root of p hat 
times 1 minus e over n. I'm just going to do I'm just going to write it once because we don't have a whole lot of space up here. E hat 1 minus e hat. You can totally read what that says, right? Uh, when we're within one standard deviation, we know that about 68% of all samples, remember we're not talking about the specific uh, <clears throat> measurement itself, we're talking about those samples, uh, will have a proportion within one standard error of p. We know that 95% of all samples will be within two standard deviations of p. And we know that 99% of all samples will have p hats within three standard deviations of p. So this sample proportion I'm finding, p hat, uh, it may not be the exact population uh, proportion. However, we know that if that is my sample proportion, that Within three standard errors of that sample proportion, I should be able to find the true population proportion. Okay, so we're estimating it with the sample proportion, but we don't know if that's we know that that's a good estimate here at the uh, population. Excuse me, the sample proportion. It's a good estimate, but since samples will vary, we know that. Within three standard deviations, we'll have 99.7. In fact, within two standard deviations, we'll have 95% of all the samples are going to fall within this in this region here, um, with 90 uh, with two standard deviations away. And so this is kind of the idea of a confidence interval, right? So looking at it from p hat's perspective, uh, there's a 95% chance that p is no more than two standard errors away from p hat. So if we reach out two standard errors, we can be 95% sure that the true population, the population proportion, will be in that interval. In other words, if we reach out two standard errors in either direction of p hat, we can be 95% confident that this interval contains the true proportion. So again, if we're looking at this normal model with a sample proportion in the middle, I can be, because 95% of my samples that I take, if I were to do repeated sampling, because I know that 95% of them fall within two standard deviations of the mean, or two standard errors from that mean, the p hat, we could be 95% confident that the true proportion is within those two standard errors, somewhere between here and here. Okay, And this word confident is a little bit tricky because it's vague, right? It doesn't say that it is within there. It just says that we can be this confident that it's in there, right? We're not certain that the true population proportion falls within two standard errors, but we're confident that it does. Notice there's kind of a difference, and it's a little wishy-washy, right? We are confident. In fact, I'm 95% confident that it's going to, uh, that the true population proportion is somewhere within this 95%. Per, percent. I'm not, I could be, it, it could be wrong, it could be outside of that, but I'm 95% confident that it's there, right? There's a, there's a, there's a good chance that it's there. Um, and that's what we call a confidence interval, right? The, the percent confidence that we will find the true proportion inside of an interval, okay? Um, so, so there's kind of a picture of it right there. Uh, we've got that p hat, and there's we we kind of think that there's a 95% chance that the samples uh, will create a, a an interval that has the proportion in it. Uh, so what does confidence really mean? 
okay? Because, again, that confidence is a wishy-washy term. Uh, so each confidence interval uses a sample statistic to estimate a population parameter, right? A sample that we've gathered to estimate something about the population. Now, samples vary. Thus, the statistics we use and the confidence interval we construct is going to vary as well. So here's a picture, okay? So we took 20 samples um, of some kind of population proportion, right? So imagine this green line right here is uh, the population proportion. And each of these blue lines is the confidence interval, right? From here to here is a 95% confidence interval. And the red dots, this red dot right there, is the sample proportion that we got. Every time we take a sample, we're going to get a different sample proportion, right? Because samples vary, life is variance, okay? Uh, so I took 20 samples, I created 20 different intervals. Notice that none of these intervals are the same. They're all the same width, right? They all are the same width because we're looking at a 95% confidence for each one. But notice that some of these intervals do not capture the population proportion, right? Uh, if we wanted to like kind of just go through and highlight a couple of these, uh, like this one right here doesn't capture the population proportion. That one right there doesn't capture the population proportion. That one right there doesn't capture the population proportion. So a confidence interval isn't a guarantee that the population proportion will be in there. However, we have many of these proportions that do capture the population proportion, right? The, that green line has been captured by most of these intervals. And that's what confidence means, right? That's what the confidence is. Uh, the confidence is that 95% of our samples, right, we are confident in the process of constructing the interval, not the interval itself. So we're, we're, confidence means that we expect 95% of all 95% confidence intervals to contain the true parameter that they're estimating. So, again, to look at this proportion again, some of these confidence intervals do not contain the population proportion. It's not about that specific interval itself, right? When I did one sample and I took uh, this one right here, it's, it's not about this exact confidence interval. That's not what confidence means. The confidence is that 95% of my confidence intervals contain the true proportion. So the one that I'm looking at may or may not, and I won't know that because we're never going to know this information, right? This information about the proportion, we're never going to know. But we can be 95% confident that this proportion is in there. I will never know for certain, but I'm 95% confident that it is. And I'm 95% confident that it is because 95% of my confidence intervals contain the true proportion. So confidence isn't about the interval itself. It's about a process that when doing it repeatedly, creating repeated intervals, 95% of them will contain that proportion. So it's a little bit confusing of a process. But let's go ahead and do one. Uh, just like any model, we need assumptions and conditions to make that happen. Uh, different models need different assumptions. You should recognize these assumptions. Um, if the assumptions are not true, the model might be inappropriate to use. And if the model is inappropriate to use, there's a good chance that your conclusions are wrong. Um, so, and again, just like with the sampling distributions, uh, we can never be sure that an assumption is true, but we can often decide whether it's plausible by checking some related things. So. Uh, here's the assumptions and conditions we need for a confidence interval. 
So checking independence. First, we need to think about whether independence is checked. One thing that I want to note on the side here, not required on the AP test. Uh, checking independence in this particular for this model is not required on the AP test. There's actually only two conditions you have to check on the AP test, and we'll talk about those ones too. too. Uh, you do not have to decide whether something is independent or not on the AP test uh, because it's kind of a it's one of those ones that's very difficult to think about. Uh, it's best not to mention it on the AP test itself because if you do and you don't write about it correctly, you'll lose that the points for that portion. Whereas if you just left it out, you would gain the points. Um, we often think about independence by checking these two conditions, the randomization and the 10% condition. I want to note on the side that this is required. The, the randomness is required on the AP test. Require, I think I spelled that wrong. Uh, required uh, on the AP test. We do have to check randomness. Uh, typically speaking, on the AP test, there will be part of the question stem that says that this was random. Okay. 10% condition. Is the sample size no more than 10% of the population? Required for a good model. However, not required for the AP test. You do not need to mention the 10% condition. Uh, not required on the AP test. Don't need to mention it on the AP test. If you mention it and don't write about it correctly, you will lose those points, so it's best just to leave it out. And then finally, the last one, which is required, is the same as what we did with the sampling distribution, and that is we need a big enough sample. And to know if our sample is big enough, we should have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures based on the uh, sample proportion. Okay, And this is the same one uh, that we did in uh, the last chapter. NP has to be greater than 10 and NQ has to be greater than 10. Finally, let's talk about critical values, and then we will put it all together to see a formula for a confidence interval. So the two in this little uh, thing right here uh, represents our 95% confidence interval, right? It comes from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, two standard deviations away. In fact, the critical value is uh, simply the number of standard errors away, right? Uh, and that's what this says down here. For any confidence level, we can find the corresponding critical value, which is the number of standard errors that corresponds to our confidence in our uh, level. If we want 95% confidence, we can estimate it at two standard deviations away. However, that is not a, a that is not an exact value. 95% um, if we're looking for an exact value is 1.96. And I'll have a separate video that shows how we make that calculation. For now, recognize that a 95% confidence interval uh, is 1.96 for this critical value. Uh, we have critical values for any confidence interval. Uh, as it turns out, if we're talking about a 90% confidence value, it's a, we bring it in a little bit more. The critical value is 1.645. And again, I will show that one in a separate video. So, putting it all together, here is a formula to find a confidence interval. Um, when the conditions are met, we can find a confidence interval for a population proportion. We start with p hat, uh, p hat being the sample proportion. And then plus or minus, we're going to add something to the proportion and we're going to subtract something. That thing we subtract is the critical value, and for a 95% confidence interval, uh, that is 1.96. And then we're going to multiply that by the standard error of p hat, which is that formula right there. And again, this z, uh, this z star, the critical value, d changes depending on what our confidence level is. And again, we'll have a separate video that shows that with calculation, how to do it all in a calculator. 
Okay, so let's do a quick problem and then we will end this video. Sam, this one's been a little bit long, sorry. So, an experiment finds that 27% of 53 subjects report improvement after using a new medicine. Create a 95% confidence interval for the actual cure rate. So this obviously, by the way, is uh, totally made up information. This isn't real stuff. Uh, these are just numbers to make it uh, to make it work. Uh, they do tell us to use a critical value of 1.96 uh, for that. Before we do this, let's check our assumptions and conditions and make sure that they match. So first of all, uh, independence, which I'm actually just going to say, hmm, I'm not going to check that one because it's not required on the AP test. Um, Random sampling. Was random sampling done? Well, they don't say anything about there being randomly selected samples. Um, I'm going to make an assumption here. It talks about an experiment, and I'm going to assume that the people who were doing the experiment were doing it correctly and randomly uh, assigning people to treatments. So uh, I'm going to write here, we are going to assume that the experimenters used random sampling. Now, that may or may not be a great assumption to make. We would want to know more about the experiment to really be able to say that for certain. Um, however, uh, we're going to make that assumption this time. Uh, again, on the AEP test, there will be a much more specific, non-vague writing in the question. Okay. Um, typically speaking, the experimenters are the ones that are doing the confidence interval, so they'll know if it was random sampling or not. 10% um, condition, yeah, I'm not going to do it because not required for the AP test. Uh, success failure condition. So we've got 27% of 53 subjects. So that's 0.27 times 53. Is that greater than 10? And then we've got 0.73 times 53. Is that greater than 10? Uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of like mind calculations here. 10% of 53 is 5.3, which means 20% is almost 11. So 27% is definitely bigger than 10. Uh, so we have uh, successes and failures, both greater than 10. So the sample size is large enough. Sample is large enough. I'm running out of space. But um, again, on the AP test, you're probably going to want to actually calculate that, that exact number and write that down. Um, but we, sometimes it's obvious enough that you can say they're both great. You can write this down and say that's definitely bigger than 10. Uh, it's really, it's most important to, uh, to have these parts written uh, so that, again, the people on the AP test grading it know that this is something that you checked and you knew what to check. That's the most important part. Okay, assumptions and conditions are met. Let's actually calculate this interval. So um, our sample size is 53. Our p hat is 0.27. Uh, so that gives us a standard error of 0 0.061. Again, we made that calculation because the standard error is the square root of p hat q hat. So 0 0.27 times 0.73 all over our sample size of 53, and that equals 0 0.061. Uh, our uh, margin of error is the z score, uh, the, the critical value times our standard error. So that's 1.96 because they tell us to use 1.96 times my standard error. That's 0 0.061. That equals 0.12. So my interval is 0.27, starting with my, because remember, the interval is p hat plus or minus uh, z critical value times standard error of p hat. So that's 0.27 plus or minus 
Uh, and so we have 0.15 to, I don't know why I'm writing it down, it's what's sitting right there. So we uh, end up with an interval of 0.15 to 0.39. So that's sort of our, our show step. Now the last thing that we need to do is to um, uh, tell our results. And the way that you do this, uh, again, AP test, we're kind of looking for a stock answer. Uh, and that stock answer is this. We are 95% confident, right? We want to state our confidence interval. State our confidence interval. How much confidence are we using here? Uh, we are 95% confident that between 15% and 39% of people will, will improve after using the new uh, after using the new medicine. So again, other things to make sure we have here: state the interval. The interval needs to be part of your solution, and then this last part: state your context. You need all three of these sort of ingredients in your solution. You need to state your confidence, and we could probably just say state your confidence instead of state your confidence interval. You need to state your confidence. We are 95% confident that between state your interval, 15% and 39% of state your context, people will improve after using the new medication. And uh, we want to talk about, let's not talk about why the interval is wide there. That's something for another day. So that's what we'll call it. Uh, if you've got questions about confidence intervals, you can leave them in the, leave them in the comment section, and we'll try to take care of you. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Have a good day.